Good morning. Not much excitement here. Good morning. <laughs> Good to hear it. Um, my thanks to the council, Deborah Wynn Smith, Sam Allen, for inviting me to share some thoughts with you today. The talk centers on better finance innovation and by that, increasing American competitiveness. And I come at these issues from a very personal perspective, based of, on over three decades working to grow private retirement savings in this country. Over that time, I've seen some amazing positive changes that have huge implications for our future. So, what I hope to leave you with today is a single critical insight, one that very few people, including the top policymakers in Washington, have yet to take aboard. And that is that the private workplace savings system we've evolved in this country is not just a source for most people's retirement. It has also become a dynamic engine for capital accumulation, for market liquidity, for the finance of innovation, and a spur to faster economic growth. Paycheck by paycheck, tens of millions of workers, retirement savings are fueling a virtuous circle of forces shown on the slide now before you. Forces that are already powerful, which we can build on to create even stronger competitive advantage for the United States. I trust in your package you all have a copy of the slide. So let me start at the center and move up to 12 noon, then go clockwise around the circle. Over the last several decades, with the rise of 401k, 403bs, 457 plans, and IRAs and many other savings vehicles, America has built up fully $28 trillion in retirement savings. Just for context, that is well over one-third of the total market capitalization of all U.S. stocks and bonds, which is $72 trillion. These retirement savings are the largest dedicated asset pool on Earth, and no other nation comes even close. In fact, these assets are the envy to many competitors around the world who are struggling with aging populations while still depending solely on tax-based, pay-as-you-go retirement systems, many of them straining at the seams. So, even though many serious shortfalls remain in America's retirement finance, and they do exist, the buildup of these assets is a huge success story. It provides us a great base to build on. What's more, we have practical insights we need from experience to identify what works and go about solving the remaining challenges of our own system. And the good news here is that more and more policymakers in Washington are beginning to understand these two facts. First, the Americans are very worried about their retirement futures. And second, that voters love proposals that make it easier and more lucrative for them to save. This crosses party lines because both Democrats and Republicans grow older every day. And they all love money. No surprise then, we're seeing a rising wave of proposals in Congress to expand and subsidize more retirement savings. In fact, Monday night, the uh, Secretary Brady released a proposal that addresses greater retirement savings. And this does have support, no matter what you read, across party lines and backing as well from the Trump administration. That's why at 12 o'clock noon on this slide, 
we suggest that the $28 trillion in savings today stands to grow dramatically by trillions more in the coming years because we can confidently expect to see legislation and regulation in Washington to provide more access to on-the-job savings for tens of millions of more workers, moving America closer to people's capitalism in which nearly every worker will have a tangible, growing equity state in the future of this country. This kind of mass investing already engages a majority of working Americans. Over 80 million of us whose regular monthly savings deductions have, have made this company's country, excuse me, stock and bond markets the deepest and most liquid on earth. And robust capital markets matter a lot for America's capacity to innovate. That's because capital markets are much more flexible and nimble in funding innovation than the bank-centered financial systems that dominate most of Europe and North Asia. Banks, for example, can't risk making loans to 10 startup companies in the hopes that one of them will multiply 20 times in value as the others fold. But those are precisely the kind of bets that capital markets make possible across a full spectrum from angel investors to venture funds to IPOs and bond market issues. I would suggest to you that capital market strength is why the most innovative technology companies on earth have grown here in the U.S. over the last generation and not in bank-centered capital systems like Japan, Germany, Korea, or France. This advantage also applies in debt markets as well as in equities. America corporations today now draw roughly two-thirds of their financing from bond markets, 65 percent, far more than traditional banks. This continuing competition between banks and capital markets in general uh, keeps the capital costs in America lower than they otherwise would be. What's more, the tens of billions flowing into our markets every paycheck from K-Plan savers play, plays a vital role in helping equity markets absorb initial public offerings. And the option to go IPO public is what gives angel and venture investors access to the profits they've invested to achieve, the much hoped for liquidity event, the pot at the end of the venture rainbow. That's how strong capital markets spur innovation and entrepreneurship. They encourage risk taking at the margin, especially for startups by offering risk takers an exit and potentially profits once their startup is strong enough to go public. This brings me to my theory of what primarily drives economic growth, and that is innovation, working both directly and indirectly and including even failed innovation. Some of you may recall the wild and crazy days of the original dot-com bubble back at the turn of the century. And you'll remember that a few of these dot-coms grew into a giant, world-changing firms like Google and Facebook. But most failed flat out, like pet.com. And yet, that wave of innovation had a powerful knock-on effect one that is still playing out on the ongoing adoption of the internet and digital technologies by old line incumbent firms across our whole economy. Innovators, in other words, force established firms to step up their game, raise productivity, and adopt new technologies, 
much faster than they would in absence of innovation. And that, over time, creates jobs and raises incomes, a process we're finally seeing playing out today, even in lower skilled, lower paid jobs. That's the virtuous circle of savings, investment, and funded innovation that workplace savers, tens of millions of them, help finance with their payroll deductions. Along the way, we're seeing a steady buildup of stakeholder wealth through these retirement plans and individual retirement accounts, the bulk of which roll over from workplace plans. The system, admittedly, is uneven and, at this point, incomplete. Some workers are doing amazingly well. There are tens of thousands of 401k millionaires. But tens of millions of people have no retirement assets at all. Roughly 40% of all workers, notably those in emerging gig economy companies, small companies, have no access to payroll savings plans on the job. None. Yet, we also know that access to payroll deduction is roughly 15 times more effective in spurring savings than tax breaks or other incentives that depend on people opening up a personal IRA. We also know from experience that tens of millions of workers who do take part in the fully automated plans and save over 10% are well on their way to replace more than 100% of their lifetime incomes. And ladies and gentlemen, that's success by any measure. And these workers are not some tiny outlier out there. There are millions of them that are on track to do this. And their key to success is automatic plan design and high savings rates. That's it. That means the challenges ahead for policymakers are clear and straightforward. One, close the coverage gap. Have it that all employers have available to them some form of workplace savings plans, including for contract and part-time employees. Make these plans fully automatic for enrollment, annual uh, escalation to 10% or more, and perhaps par partial annualization. That's it. We know where to go with these plans today. But getting from today's partial success to a fully fleshed out system takes smart legislation and forward looking flexible regulation to encourage continued innovation. Again, let me say here I'm very optimistic that more and more policymakers in Washington from both parties are coming to understand this. And I expect to see major progress soon, perhaps even in this lame duck Congress, and surely in 2019. That confidence rests in the growing understanding in Washington that over long term, raising retirement savings can actually increase government revenue, lift economic growth rates, and help deal with long-term fiscal pressures. Four years ago, Putnam Investments led a coalition of groups, including the U.S. Chamber of Commerce and ARP, to support a study by Oxford Economics of the economic impact of raising American savings. It is called Another Penny Saved, and its findings were crystal clear. Raising savings through reforms I've just mentioned would spur additional economic growth that could add trillions to America's future GDP over the next generation. 
This is thousands of dollars per capita. And I might add, you can find another penny saved online if you want to take a look. What's more important about the study is not just that it drew the connections between higher savings and faster long-term growth. It really spurred on top policymakers in Washington to begin to make the connection themselves. I believe that's one reason why we just went through the recent tax bill, the tax reforms, and retirement incentives were untouched. There was a lot of discussion about it. They didn't increase the savings incentives, but they didn't go after them like they did in the last major tax reform in 1986. Wonder, one other insight gaining traction in D.C. today is that every dollar of retirement savings is one less dollar that individual or family will ever ask from the government in the future, at least for any means-tested help like Medicaid. The America's People's Retirement Assets, that's $28 trillion again, also protect the government from future liability. Personal solvency and national solvency reinforce each other. Once you assume that as a country we will somehow provide income and medical care for elders through this system. There's only two ways to do it. We all know it. Either transfer revenue from the current economy to those in need or help workers accumulate assets that grow with time which they can use in old age. Taxes on current activity are a pretty short drain on the economy. They have no dynamic investment impact. But savings directed into our capital markets are an investment in the future. And the longer time horizon, the surer the gains. When you think about that for even a minute, I hope you agree with me that this country should do all we can to encourage people to save as early in life as they can, so that we as a people can harness what Albert Einstein called the most powerful force in the universe, compound interest, and use it to ensure dignified retirements for all. That's why I hope this year we'll see more and more policy leaders understand and act on the single insight I aim to leave with you today, and that is retirement savings are just not about retirees' income. The workplace savings system is a dynamic, globally unique engine for capital formation, investment, growth, and greater American competitiveness. It is, in fact, one of the keys to sustaining and improving America's competitiveness to, for the rest of this new century. I say, let's build on it, and thank you very much for listening. Appreciate it. Thank you.